Well, welcome all to the first in a series of workshops to launch our new project here at SOAS, the Carceral Policy uh, Policing and Race Project. Uh, I'm delighted to have been appointed a professor of practice at SOAS to head up this project alongside uh, policy fellow Ollie DeRose. Um, I think it's probably right to say that in the wake of a resurgent Black Lives Matter movement, we've witnessed a sense of urgency over the relationship between race, policing, prisons and detention. Um, however, it's probably also true to say that this is not translated um, into a sustained conversation about the truly global reality of Black uh, and Indigenous suffering, internment and injustice. Uh, the relationship between race, policing and prisons um, has largely been explored through the context of the global north, um, perhaps with the United States dominating much, dominating much of the conversations. Uh, and this project uh, is drawing in marginalised populations uh, in the global south. Uh, almost 980 thousand people are currently incarcerated across the continent of Africa, um, the home of 53 countries of profound diversity. Uh, Africa is nevertheless a site of several cross-continental characteristics, namely the unsafe, overcrowded conditions that we see inside their prisons. Similarly, in South America, 950,000 people are currently uh, in prison. This is close to my heart because my family stemmed from the wonderful country uh, of Guyana on the northeast corner of South America. Um, and it's alongside 350,000 prisoners in Central America and 120,000 across the Caribbean. In Asia, the number exceeds a staggering 3 million. Uh, and these carceral experiences are routinely ignored by a discussion uh, of um, mass incarceration, largely rooted, as I said, uh, through a United States-centric framing of disproportionality, criminal justice, and mass incarceration. Uh, this workshop then introduces the central aim of the broader project, which is to recalibrate the discussion, to amplify the carceral experience of marginalized communities around the world, and dig deeper into the various meanings uh, of being incarcerated itself. And at the heart of this is a central question, how have forms of incarceration, detention, and repression across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean shaped uh, by colonialism and slavery? What does that look like? To answer this question, I'm delighted to be joined by four wonderful speakers. Dr. Stella Ningazi is a Ugandan human rights activist, medical anthropologist and poet, She's also a political activist with campaigns for women and girls and rights, as well as the rights of uh, LGBTQ plus communities. She's most known for her outspoken criticism uh, of the Ugandan president Museveni's, which led to her imprisonment at a maximum security uh, uh, facility. Um, and I'm joined also by Dr. Dylan Kerrigan, who's a Caribbean, Caribbeanist I've known for many years, uh, who's into disciplinary research explores coloniality and punishment in the Caribbean across various injustice systems under capitalism, including prisons, court systems, transnational organized crime and securitization. He's currently a lecturer in criminology at the University of Leicester um, uh, in the UK uh, and was previously a lecturer in sociology and political anthropology at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad. Uh, he currently works with a multidisciplinary research team uh, researching the definition, extent and experience of the treatment of mental, neurological and substance abuse disorders uh, in Guyana's prisons in, in South America. Uh, also joined by Dr. Uh, Wungi Kamari, who's an anthropologist at the Institute of Humanities in Africa at the University of Cape Town. Uh, her work draws on many local histories and theoretical approaches, including oral narratives, uh, urban political ecology, the black radical tradition, the anthropology of empire, the anthropology of violence, um, the anthropology of subjectivity in order to think through urban spatial management uh, uh, in Nairobi from the vantage point of its most marginalized um, residents. 
uh, and we're also joined by Annie um, Finst. I hope I pronounced that properly, Annie, even though you told me, who's an independent scholar and artist and a visiting research fellow in sociology at Goldsmiths University uh, here in London. Annie brings an inter interdisciplinary visual, archival and discursive practice on apprehension of materiality and spatiality of settler colonial violence in the carceral and colonizing geographies of Kenya uh, and historic Palestine. Uh, thank you so much for giving up your time. Um, I'll ask each speaker to present for around 15 to 20 minutes before opening up to questions from other speakers in the audience. Uh, after the last speaker is presented, we'll open up to the floor again to try and draw some connections between the three presentations. Um, Ollie will be monitoring the chat if you have any questions, so please feel free to post any queries um, um, uh, in the chat box throughout the workshop. I hope you're all um, on silent so that we can run this smoothly. You'll forgive me that I will have to leave 10 or 15 bef minutes before the end and uh, Ollie DeRose will bring this to a close. So can I invite Dr. Stella Nangazi to speak first? Right, thank you very much. I'd like to share the screen. I'm delighted to be invited to um, this Am I sharing the screen as yet or not yet? Yes, 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 we can see it. Okay, good. So, yes. Um, so, to the workshop on the colonialities of incarceration across the global south, which is organized under the Casserole Policy, Policing and Rest Series of the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS. I offer some reflexive musings as a decolonial radical queer feminist scholar and activist who is also an ex-convict. I'm an ex-con, a former remanded prisoner and potential future inmate of Luzira Women Prison. This cartoon and all other graphic illustrations that I use in this presentation are taken from popular culture materials that were produced circulated, uh, consumed and reproduced by local and international artists, photojournalists, based on my widely publicized experiences of prison and incarceration in Uganda. I have been detained 22 times in police cells, police posts, police units, uh, border and control police units, special investigation units, and um, most of the times I've been arrested because I was protesting against um, diverse forms of oppressive power in Uganda. I enter this space as a Ugandan woman who has been imprisoned two times in Uganda maximum security prison called Luzira Women Prison, both times on charges of cyber harassment um, and offensive communication against dictator President Yoweri Museveni and his family. I was remanded for 33 days the first time, and the second time I spent 305 days in prison, which included time as a remandee, as a convict, and as an appellant against my conviction and sentence. And I think I'm fortunate that all my detention facilities, the ones I named before in the police post, and the one in prison, have been officially gazetted, unlike several other individuals in Uganda who've been detained in unidentifiable safe houses and torture chambers where um, one cannot trace where they were. And so one cannot uh, go back for redress. And so when you're talking about the colonial legacy, there's a new versions of detention, which were perhaps created in post-independence Uganda. So, although I was imprisoned both times in prison for writing critically about the excesses, failings, and violations of Museveni's dictatorship, the first time I just wrote a poet post on Facebook, and the second time I wrote a poem, a long, beautifully crafted poem commemorating the president's birthday, I published a book collection of 154 poems while in prison. A month before my acquittal from prison, I won the Oxfam Novip uh, in collaboration with Penn International Freedom to Write Award. Writing and publishing while a prisoner in a prison facility that does not allow women to write is subversion 
of the colonial prison sentence. If prison was slapped on me in order to deter me as an individual or indeed to deter the wider collective of dissident writers uh, from writing irreverently and disrespectfully about executive state power within this repressive regime, my insistence on writing poems and colluding with good friends who co conspired with me to smuggle the poems out of prison stood the logic of punitive state on its, state, on its head. And so drawing from a colonial legacy of women prisoners being amenable to correction, open to rehabilitation and submissive to penitentiary authority who reformed colonized savages, the Uganda prison services were not prepared for a dissident writing woman opposed to prison reformation. I entered prison as a dissident writer. I lived in prison as a dissident writer. When I was in solitary confinement, I wrote with shit on the walls as a dissident writer. This imprisoned subaltern was speaking back, speaking against, speaking at oppressive colonial state power. By the time prison wardresses realized I was always writing about the everyday life in prison, it was too late to stop me from writing in order to smuggle my writings out of the maximum security prison facility I was. By the time I was prohibited from reading newspapers or accessing the underused library, my smuggled writings were already circulating on social media. By the time my writings were routinely searched, confiscated and destroyed by fire as I watched, I had set up a counter process of writing in duplicate, sometimes triplicate and smuggling my pieces out of the prison. When I turned 45 years old in prison, comrades on the outside ensured that key influencers in Uganda published 45 of my poems to celebrate my 45 years on their different social media platforms. In the poems, I continued criticizing the dictatorship and I also exposed the failings of the prison in which I was a prisoner. So how was I able to write poems in and about prison? Trained up to a doctoral level as an ethnographer for whom participant observation and qualitative research methods of in-depth interviews and focus group discussions were my daily staple, my prison time facilitated ethnographic fieldwork. I didn't get clearance or ethical permissions, but I was doing fieldwork inadvertently. Since writing extensive field notes was impractical because prisoners were not allowed to take written materials out of prison, I committed to remembering important facts through writing poems that were stolen out. Often I wrote about conversations I held with prisoners as in the cartoon that, was, that I share. Um, I wrote about the conversations that I held with prisoners. I shared about experiences and uh, of a confinement. And I also reflected on more abstract ideas of freedom, equality, power, and justice. As a storyteller and consumer of gossip, I often gave and received information from several prisoners, prison wardresses, and affiliated workers or visitors to the prison, such as priests we had to go to for sermons and confession, health workers, outreach workers, philanthropists, legal aid officers, etc. And I want to refer to, I, I share a, a, a quote from one of the reviews of my poetry book who said that the state actually paid for my 18 month um, writing retreat and uh, they gave me thousands of captive respondents via which to study Uganda. Indeed, prison time for me, unlike several other uh, colonized prisoners or others in the post-independent Uganda, prison was an ethnographic field site for me. Right, so although I could speak about the political economy of food and eating in prison, punishment, violence and torture in prison, hygiene and sanitation, mental health issues, hard labor extracted for free um, for the country, but also across borders, pregnant prisoners and mothering in prison, death and disposal of prisoners, gender, sex orientation and sexual orientation and sexuality, friendship and loss of friendship, processing justice while imprisoned, religion and conversion in 
prison education and skills training programs in prison, congestion, surveillance and monitoring of prisons, lice, fleas and ticks in prison, all interesting themes. But in the limited time that I'm left with, I will discuss how prison can be or how I used an appropriated prison to decolonize and undo colonial legacies entrenched within the law. I will discuss this decolonization through the lenses of three of my health challenges when I was at Luzira Women Prison, namely my release the first time on bail due to an episode of severe malaria. And I have a picture indeed where wardresses are carrying me. I have a cannula on my arm. Um, denial of access to post to private post-abortion care after suffering a miscarriage due to torture by prison wardresses and an episode in which state prosecutors attempted to subject me to involuntary mental examination. On May 10th, 2017, I was released on bail from Luzira Women Prison because I was suffering from acute malaria. Too dizzy and frail to walk on my own, I was supported by two prison wardresses to the suspect's dock in court. The colonial legacy of release on bail, which made its way into several post-independence constitutions, is a catalyst for uh, the humongous backlog of unresolved pending court cases in a lot of global South, but specifically African countries. Bail deflates away from effectively using prison as a grounds for resistance, and it gives currency to the uses of police arrest detention and charging as deterrence to sustained dissidents. And in my subsequent prison sent uh, prison time imprisonment, I remember choosing the legal strategy of refusing to apply for bail so that we would force the state to prosecute and try me if indeed by expressing myself freely, I was committing a crime against the person of the president. And so by refusing myself the constitutional right to bail, a right indeed that was carved within colonial times, I was challenging the very coloniality that gives prisoners freedom and thereby gives the state reason not to further pursue them in court. I will move to the second example. Prior to receiving my bail application, the magistrate received an application from the state prosecutors to subject me to involuntary mental examination. In the mind of the state, the logic of the state, a woman cannot write critically, so graphically about executive power unless she has fallen mentally ill. This application relied on the Mental Treatment Act of 1935, which was amended in 1940. Uganda received her independence in 1962. And so the application relied on uh, the Mental Treatment Act, which preferred immediate mental exam and treatment for colonial people who denied and dared to criticize colonial administrators. I learned that it was not mere rhetoric when two government psychiatrists came to prison to try and start assessing my mental status. I fought them off verbally and was able to put away the forced mental exam only by applying for constitutional interpretation of this law and thereby I halted what was otherwise a colonial relic that still stood on our statute books. Having been released in 2018, I was among the few Ugandans who interacted with the parliamentary review committee that revealed the mental treatment uh, act at the time and the law was amended taking away some of cl the clauses such as the one that led to my application uh from to the state prosecutor's application for my mental examination on grounds of my critique of the government the last example i want to discuss hmm i'm not doing very well for time but the last example i want to discuss relates to my battle for access to my medical treatment medical records when I was a prisoner, I was tortured by prison wardresses. I was pregnant and I lost my two month old pregnancy, needing access to private post-abortive care. This was denied to me 
although I applied through the courts of law, I applied to Uganda Human Rights Commission, and I also tabled um, a, an appeal before the Uganda Prison Services. The argument was that indeed the law denied prisoners, ex-prisoners access to their medical records. And so in terms of discussing the coloniality uh, and, and that is visible within these three examples that I suffered from my, men, my medical uh, access to medical care in prison, it is clear that issues around safe custody, notions of safe custody are cushioned. Human rights of prisoners is uh, violated often. And I wanted to talk about corporal punishment, which was taken off the books of law in Uganda that continues many prisoners, especially pregnant and uh, other women of reproductive age suffer irreparable damage from corporal punishment. Torture within prison by prisoners and prison staff continues. And uh, there's inadequate medical um, provisioning. And so for me, I just want to say that from this example, the three examples I have shared, it is clear to me that political prisoners can mobilize prison practice as a site of resistance to colonial relics. In my own incident, the short biography I've shared, I challenged the Mental Treatment Act of 1930. I challenged the denial of access to medical, uh, prison medical health facilities. And I also want to highlight that we are discussing how medical military healthcare workers are deployed to efface, remove evidence of torture of torture victims in prison. As I conclude, I just want to say that many times the stories and the power of elite women who are imprisoned are often denied and currency and neglected. When the stories are told about prison, it's often stories told by men, stories told by elite, and stories told by the Western gaze looking upon Africa. But I think that it's important to utilize and be able to mobilize elite Africans, including women, but also people of non-binary genders to tell the stories that happen in prison, the stories that have otherwise been silenced in order to do decolonial work in the prison setting. This was kind of my concluding um my concluding slide, because of time, well, I, I just wanted to say that um, in terms of, of the contribution that I, I want to make towards the discussion, I want to say that not everything is legible. Not all forms of incarceration are legible. They are places such as safe houses and torture chambers that are known because the bodies of ex-prisoners come out marked with torture, but where these have taken place in Uganda cannot be retraced. And so we cannot get redressed because we don't know where the torture is happening. We don't know who is responsible. Colonizers do not expect women prisoners to write and speak back and subvert power. And it looks to me, it seems that the prisons were not made for emancipated speaking women. I think for me that uh, a gender differentiation in who produces knowledge for and about prisons in in Uganda must be addressed. A lot of the work that has come out of the prison system is either by the oppressors in prison writing or by um, colonized Ugandans who've gone through Western education systems writing for the prisoners. Rarely do prisoners who are not empowered with formal education writing their stories and telling them. I want to talk about the gender binaries, but that I will skip. I, th I think one of the problems with the colonial legacy in places like Uganda is that the Commonwealth left us with a binary system of gender, binary system of prisons. We have male prisons and female prisons, and so transgender and intersex people, but also queer people are often misgendered in terms of how the penalties are given to them, and this has not been redressed, and this introduces a politics of gendered sexualities within prison that has not even been touched in some of the literature that I've seen. As I conclude, I just want to say that um, this is 
a wonderful platform that has been created. And I hope that more and more we can have the input of prisoners and ex-prisoners who are of African origin, who are African, who are from the Global South contributing and that the sort of empowerment that's going to come from this platform will also be extended to people in prison, people who have been to prison, such that we're not just producing knowledge from the outside for people on the inside, but that insiders to these cultures can also participate. I thank you very much. Stella, Yanzi, thank you so much for that fantastic, wonderful, wonderful uh, opening start. If <laughs> It was just a wonderful way to begin. We're so grateful for your um, sacrifice, your witness, your testimony, your advocacy, um, your strength and your power. So I'm really, really very grateful and very humbled um, that you're with us and you've kicked us off to such a fantastic start. Um, let me just open this up for questions. I probably should have said um, uh, to indicate that you might have a question in the chat box or well I think to, to do it quickly now if you can just raise your hand or press the raise button I'm going to ask Ollie to help me with this because it involves but there must be um, questions um, very surprised if there aren't there's one from Chris David Chris okay can I just go Yes, just go. Okay, actually, thank you very much for the very interesting um, talk um, about your work and, and your experiences. Um, one thing that I was wondering about when uh, listening to your story is um, what did in the end make you keep going? Uh, like, what was your motivation? Um, especially when you were like incarcerated for I think 22 times? No, maybe I just got that wrong. How often again? <laughs> Hold that, Chris. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm actually. What I'm gonna do is because I've got a feeling there might be a few more questions, and then I'm gonna come back to you. So I'm gonna give you some breath, Stella. <laughs> we'll come back to you, uh, uh, Vivian. I can see Vivian's hand out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always uh, very wonderful to hear uh, Dr. Stella Nyanzi speak. Um, I, I wanted to perhaps ask. Uh, what you can say about the feminist contribution to expanding the carceral state. Uh, we know that a lot of, particularly in responding to gender-based violence, we see a lot of feminist interve interventions that focus on um, you know, poli expanding policing, expanding imprisonment and calling for criminalization. Uh, what do you think about that? Especially um, because I'm from Kenya, I see that a lot and also parts of, uh, uh, you know, different parts of, of Africa as well. So could you comment on the role of feminist in expanding this uh, state here? Casserole, yeah. Any other questions for Stella Lutz, is it Lutz? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Stella, for this wonderful presentation. Now, I'm coming from sort of a human rights law perspective. You know, when, it, when we look at the positive obligations of states, you know, to prevent uh, torture, for example, one of the, the main focus of the anti-torture movement has been <coughs> to address uh, impunity and to call for accountability of the perpetrators. Now, this would normally also involve incarceration. So there have been some critics of this turn towards the coercive and carceral in human rights law. So to put it perhaps in a slightly provocative way, is there good and bad incarceration in that sense? Depend, does it then depend on the political motivation or should we, irrespective of what anyone has done, go beyond incarceration to deal with whatever kind of wrongdoing? And obviously I don't imply in, in your case that there was any wrongdoing because it was clearly politically motivated, but I think it goes beyond that. Any other questions uh, for Stella? Anyone else with their hand up that I've missed? Um, Ah, thanks so much for this. Can I also ask if Dr. Stella envisions any practical and legal ways to move from colonial leftover gender binaries in the prison system? 
any practical and legal ways to move beyond the clone of leftover gender binaries in the prison system. And can I just ask one question, which is, um, to what extent do you think we can come up with systems, if that's not too loaded a word, that are um, African, Ugandan, um, not colonial, or are the two now too intertwined? I is your ex, was your experience? Do you see it as a colonial experience, or is it a African? Is it both? I, I, it's a it's a loaded question, but I just wonder what your reaction is to that. Thank you very much. Uh, Stella, do come back. Shall I, shall I respond? I yes, saw the dean's yes. hand up. I mean, thank you all very much for wonderful questions. I will not pretend I can answer all of them brilliantly, but I'll try. What kept me going? I said I was arrested 22 times. The post-COVID, the COVID lockdown period in Uganda called for a lot of protests. So I was arrested protesting again for food. <laughs> there were hungry people we needed to eat. I was caught protesting when I crossed the border. The, the borders were locked, but the president was traveling in and out of the country. So I traveled out of the country without a visa and I was caught. And, and, and for me, the issue was to get caught and highlight the issue of how can you lock down when you're getting out? If you lock down, lock us all down. I was arrested. Um, so, so I was arrested many times. What kept me going was the detention, I, I've written a poem where I say I wear a prison as a medal, a medallion of honor. I don't enter prison as a criminal, I enter prison as a political prisoner. <laughs> and, 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 and people have said to me, yes, you, you are charged with being a public nuisance, you're charged with offending the president or the dictator. And I say that is welcome, that is a welcome charge to, to be guilty of offending a repressive authoritarian is welcome. And so what kept me going was that it was important to do the sort of work I was doing and that my trial was often a trial of the entire dictatorship. And so to answer the question around, um, well, I'll, I'll come to it, uh, the, the question about um, coloniality and, and what we can do with prison. But the feminist contribution question from Vivian, um, I am one of the people who have argued both ways for incarceration, but also for, for abolition of, of, of the prison system, particularly when it comes to, when it comes to, 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 to gender-based violence. Um, I have argued in relation to women who murder children who murder their spouses because of mental illness problems, that I saw mental health reform that could only have taken place through the counseling that was provided by psychiatrists in prison. For some women in rural areas where psychiatric offices are not offered, where the, the, the mental health services in a country are so dire and sparse, the only places they could have obtained that sort of intervention was in prison and I saw reform happening. And so in the absence of alternative mental health care in Uganda, to merely say that um, gender-based violence will be dealt away with alternatives outside the, 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 the system is, is not acceptable. I think for me that there are women who have been violated and can only get justice when the perpetrators of violence are brought to book. And for them, it is, it is, it is the only way that amends can be made. I think that there are issues around um, uh, parents for whom um, restraining orders can only come through the, the legal processes where children and custodial care can only be taken th through a legal process and the judiciary system, which inevitably has prison as one of the 
potential, uh, potential penalties that are given. And so it is not always clear to me that incarceration must be done away entirely, especially when no alternatives are given for, for and against gender-based violence. I haven't answered that question well, but that's my initial thought. We've, we've been debating, and I think for me, I see both ends happening. Defunding, the, the other point, as a person who's been in prison, defunding, defunding prison when women are suffering from urinary tract infections and there's no medicine, just doesn't make sense. When antiretroviral therapies run out and there's no more, and, and people who are stuck on those drugs or dialysis, you know, have people who need access to dialysis, people who need access to critical life support, defunding in the absence of alternatives, especially also for, for, for people doing life sentence and those who are condemned in Uganda doesn't work. It, I, I need to hear the alternatives. And in the context of Uganda, there are none put on the table. Lutz question, human rights, low positive obligation of the state. Mm. Sorry, can I come in, Stella? Because I think you yes. addressed the question to a large extent already when you talk okay. about gender-based violence and whether someone who is guilty of gender-based violence, which is also a form of torture, whether or not they should be in prison or not. I mean, that was sort of the gist of my question, or whether we okay. should move beyond incarceration altogether. So, so I, I think for me that in contexts like Uganda, um, where perpetrators of torture are using state machinery and are above the law, right? That the only way to, to be able to catch them and redress them sometimes is to make them face the law and and what might perhaps deter them is, is to lock them up because it's the only language that a violent punitive state understands especially for perpetrators of torture who are using the state and the state machinery to to continue this harm um and I think that is one of the things they fear, or only the only thing they fear, the possibility of, 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 of being detained. And so, and so for me, I think before we entirely, you know, write it all off, um, I think in situations of especially immense totalitarian militant military regimes where even civilians are forced to be uh, tried in military courts and are, uh, imprisoned in military prisons that sometimes putting the very perpetrators of this in their own prisons is a, is, is a way to curb this or deter anymore. Um, someone asked for a practical legal way to move from gender. I mean, from gender binaries in the prison system. I think for me that one of them could be to have alternative gender cells as well. I, I, I was with an intersex prisoner who was called my daughter and called my son. And when he died, we didn't know what he was. He, he died of COVID-19 in prison. And part of the problem was that when the lesbian couples were being punished in prison, this person was always at the center of the witch hunts of lesbian couples. And often he said to me, because he, I called him son, he asked me to call him son. He said to me, I was put in the wrong cell. Why was I locked up with women? I am not a woman, okay? Why would they put all this temptation before me? And I think that in the case of this intersex person, they often said they wouldn't fit in an all male cell. And, 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 and his fear was the men would rape me immediately. But on the other hand, I say, but you're fisting on all these girls all the time. And he said, but I'm, I'm not a girl. And they're here, this temptation before me. And I think part of what he said, may his soul rest in peace, is when you go out, you must ask for cells, if, if not prisons for, for third gender people, at least cells within facilities where third gender people 
um, can, 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 can be kept, can be put. So that's one, one way of doing it. The other way is, um, I, I think for me, part, part of the problem around the, 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 the non-binary um, in, incarceration of non-binary people uh, stories of torture, sexual torture, where the the politics of gender in prisons is is redone merely by putting them in these misgendered uh, prison wards, especially in the zero women prison. Only the mentally ill or people who have contagious illnesses can afford access to a free cell, a, a, an individual cell. The rest of us were sleeping on the floors in. Um, open ward systems. And in that system for me, I kept wondering how the prison was blind to, to all the sexual activity that was happening. I was often penalized for carrying deodorant roll on sticks. They were confiscated because there was a fear I was masturbating with this deodorant sticks, but way above me, there were people actually having um, intercourse. Um, and, and, and so, and so the, the narrow thinking, I think one of, one of the practical ways is to begin teaching <laughs> prison officers about gender and how it works and how it doesn't work and to abuse them of the idea, the colonial idea that there are men and women, girls and boys, and it's all just biological. I think first of all, the lessons would be useful because in Commonwealth countries such as Uganda, the British colonial legacy of man and woman, full stop, carries currency and there's no recognition of transgender or alternative genders. Stella, yes. Stella, I'm gonna, I'm gonna that's Thank a you very place. much. <laughs> that's, a, that's a powerful place to uh, uh to to uh, we're gonna come back to all of you at the end, but I want to try and run to time. We've got a little bit over. Uh thank you so much uh for that fantastic opening contribution and uh, answers there. Can I bring in now um, Dylan Kerrigan? Thanks, David, and, and thank you, Stella. That was, uh, you know, really, really um, um, informative and, and bringing lots of ideas together. Um, I'm going to share my screen, too, to just give you some stuff to look at um, while I'm talking. This um, presentation um, is Oops, sorry, it's something that where I draw on um, historical, anthropological and criminological research in um, colonial and post-colonial archives of Guyana. And I, I want to try to, to provide a little bit of the historical context of Guyana, a little bit about um, the kind of current situation and then some sort of conceptual um, information and ideas that, 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 that are kind of circulating amongst us at the moment as we, as we think about the project. Um, the project actually concentrates on mental, neurological and substance abuse disorders in Guyana's jails, um, both amongst inmates and the people who work with them. And we try to connect this to the British colonial period of um, 1814 to 1966. And so these are some of the research questions um, from that project. I'm gonna not really be talking about these questions, but I want to give you the, the broader context of, of the project. Today, I kind of want to talk a little bit more about um, bio, the biopolitics of carcerality as a way to imagine the connections between um, colonialism and its afterlife. And I think um, Stella already did a really good job of this already. Um, in the Caribbean, oh, sorry, I also wanted to present the, the team members um, of my research project. Um, we're led by Professor Claire Anderson um, at the University of Leicester and Professor Melissa Ifill at the University of Guyana. And the team is a mixture of, of, of colleagues from the University of Guyana Guyana and the University of Leicester. One of the things we found quite useful um, in the Caribbean is, is the concept of biopolitics, um, because it helps us to understand the power dynamics between both colonizers and the colonized and how hierarchies extended and grew specifically through the regulation um, and control of incarcerated bodies. Um, this is, would include also what that relationship extends to and looks like to, today. Um, and in this Caribbean sense, it's always important to connect, you know, something like Foucault to Fanon's work. Um, and in particular, how does the colonial regime 
dehumanize the colonized subject by targeting the body and its dignity, while also denying it the opportunity to be human. And the sort of the role that carcerality itself, both inside and outside of the prison, plays in this process. And as some commentators have, have, have suggested, colonial biopolitics does not only beat the colonized body into the dead or dying, it renders through slow, protracted violence of denial, the descent of the human into the non-human. And this is where Fanon is speaking not of instantly transformative violence and not specifically of violence events, but of sustained violence. And I think that's one way we can think about coloniality as a kind of sustained violence. And we can see it in the relationship between colonial governmentality um, and post-colonial carcerality. <clears throat> Specifically, I think how the biopolitics of carcerality today can connect the past and present together, um, while also showing how these early forms of colonial carcerality shape the prisons that followed and that we have today. So colonial prisons in, Gu in British Guyana, let me just provide a little bit of background on this. Um, so what's the relationship between prisons and colonial governmentality, this desire to control laboring populations in British Guyana? Well, before the abolition of slavery in 1833, punitive sanctions were really largely in the gift of slave owners um, in this, what was a sugar colony. Afterwards, the British oversaw the construction of complex carceral infrastructure to manage emancipated people and ultimately their descendants alongside the colony's indigenous population and later migrants. This included regulations on things like vagrancy, um, on the control of alcohol and intoxicants, um, the building of hospitals and lunatic asylums, and of course, the construction of prisons and, and a penal settlement, um, each of which were becoming better connected and interconnected with the plantation economy. Um, prisons were first introduced um, while the Dutch were there to the colonies of Damero, Esquibo and Berbis. Um, and following the loss of the colonies to the British, British colonial authorities took over the prisons that were already in New Amsterdam and Georgetown. Um, and the role of these prisons in this early era was really to, 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 confine, to confine enslaved men and women. Um, and in separate accommodations, also civil prisoners for things like um, debts and stuff like that. Um, the legal rights of slave owners to punish and the high fees associated with confinement, which were payable by the plantation owners, ensured the need for the prisons at this time actually remained quite limited. Um, and instead, the colonial state um, delegated authority over the enslaved to, um, to, the, to, the, to the plantation owners, the slaveholders, um, and placing little constraint on their, their, their use of violence. Um, over time, anti-slavery movements, humanitarian sentiments in the 19th century sort of pushed back and said it was a bit con um, controversial um, and there were shifts in the law somewhat. Um, and, and this meant that the colonial government suddenly became more responsible for, for such services. Um, and this is really when the period of coloniality or carceral colonial carcerality sorts of emerges. Um, from this point forward, labor discipline was enforced by the state. Um, this included legislation restricted the movement of those formerly enslaved, the regulation of, 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 and of, of consumption of alcohol, um, imprisoning workers who, 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 who broke their contracts. It also included the development of Her Majesty's penal settlement in Mazaruni and also some other coastal district prisons. And Mazaruni is uh, down the East Quibu and is quite um, removed from, from the rest of Guyana and its location. Um, of course, at this time, incarceration was designed to, to invoke terror um, and, you know, iron restraints and, and many of the things that we've documented um, about the ill treatment of prisoners took place at this time. Um, at this time, also, there were, there were the the need for, for, for further investigations due to the concerns about this ill treatment and, and the passing of different bills, which sort of gave more control to the governors um, in, the, in the context of making reforms. However, as, we, as you see, the reforms never really happened, even though that the, the new prison rules suggested improving li li living conditions, um, improve, improving the management and the buildings. Um, however, in the face of these reforms, we still got lots of reports of officer misconduct, the mixing of civil and criminal prisoners, poor living conditions, overcrowding, and the mixing of civil and criminal um, prisoners, poor living conditions, as I sort of said, um, and, 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 on, and onward. So we have this kind of system that by the mid-19th century, the, 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 
the colony and the, uh, the, the, the colonial government is, is using the prisons to control the colony's increasingly diverse population. Um, and also sort of to, to reverse the decline of British Guyana's plantations. And we can put this in the context of, of the coloniality of power and so forth. <clears throat> um, in the context of prison labor, it was supposedly designed to accustom prisoners to regular work. Um, um, but really it was for their immediate productive capacity. Um, and in the later decades of the 19th century, expectations of physical punishment were largely replaced with a regime of psychological hardship. Um, and this included things like solitary confinement, restrictive diets, um, the ability to extend imprisonment for insubordination, for breaking the rules. And of course, prisons became sites of, of resistance um, and during these times. Um, by the late 1930s, um, anti-colonialism, growing Guyanese nationalism, the emergence of the welfare state, had pushed the British to try to reform again a kind of new interventionist model of, um, of colonialism, of, 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 of an attempt to sort of justify their rule. This included things like industrial training and education. Wait. And Sylvan. So, oh, sorry. so I gave you this background because I wanted to connect it to colonial Why carcerality and post independence Guyana. And of course, there's lots more I could say about this historical period, and we have a lot of evidence. Um, but in the short time I had, I just kind of wanted to pick out some key little points. In this next sort of section, I just want to talk about colonial carcerality in post-independence Guyana and link this to some of the information we've gathered from the Guyanese prison service, its annual reports, stuff around prison infrastructures, prison regimes, um, semi-structured interviews that we've done, that we've collected. These are pictures of, of current prisons. In the top left is Lusignan prison. In the top right is Lusignan Holding Bay, which is the remand yard. In the bottom left is the Georgetown fire in 2017. And in the bottom right is the aftermath of the Georgetown fire. To keep things simple, I'm gonna to connect to, to three key themes um, in, our, in our historical work, enslavement, the management of labor, and the failure of, of, of reform efforts. So the inmates themselves in the prisons that we talk to make comparisons to slavery, while also of course noting differences too. Nonetheless, in contemporary Guyanese society, those incarcerated in prisons today are also most often the same population groups from previous times. So it's black, Asian, indigenous, and minority ethnic individuals from the same kind of economic and educational backgrounds and socially challenged locations, such as Georgetown, West East Rumfeld, or, or Boys Town, South Bromfield, Long Avenue, and other non-depressed communities, but ones that are still slightly economically challenged. And I think this connects to Fanon's sustained violence, and it connects the sort of inside of British Guyana's colonial prisons to the outside social world of contemporary Guyana today. And I think it's connected to a broader process of material impoverishment, the creation of what scholars call poverty archipelagos, and in Guyana's context, the harsh criminalization of, of poverty and cannabis. Um, and, and then it creates a kind of dehumanization loop that goes on between the prisoners and the communities from which prisoners are most often taken. Um, as, as Stella noted, it's similar in Guyana today. Many Guyanese um, prisoners are still physically beaten, even though these, these rules have changed, some by staff, some by other inmates. They're forced to live in conditions that are described as inhumane, life-threatening, not fit for human habitation. The cells are overcrowded, unsanitary, bestial food. Food is often served. Um, again, bodies are surveilled and controlled and boredom sorts of do dominates. Also, there's a continuance of colonial corporal punishment being placed in dark cells, um, repeated solitary confinement, reduction of diet, continuities that are pretty clear between the past and the present. Also, the management of labor continues, like those enslaved on plantations, prisoners in the post-1966 era are still manual labor. Um, in the 1970s, this was really around agricultural activities and prisoners at Georgetown, for example, made bread not only for the use in prison, but also for all government hospitals. Um, and there's you know, information on the different kinds of work that they would do. In the 1976 report, we see that 65% of the 924 prisoners were actually employed 
um, full time. Um, if you look at the kind of numbers in 2016, it's a similar number. It's around 70 is kind of increased. It's around 71 percent are now employed in some kind of labor. That's out of a, a population of 10, uh, 1047. These jobs have changed, though. There are not so many agricultural laboring jobs now. What you see more is doing the staff work of the prison, like cleaners, orderlies, construction. So there's been a decline in manual labor, not a decline in manual labor rather, but in the kinds of employment um, alongside new types of employment. Um, and more generally, there's been a failure of reforms. Um, as, as, as the preceding information suggests, um, the most glaring holdover is the infrastructure of prisons in Guyana. Three of the present prison sites were, were built in the 19th century. The 19th century problem of overcrowding has remained. Um, it's not just lack of space, but the condition of the buildings. Um, Georgetown and New Amsterdam prisons were constructed of wood and had been um, identified as fire hazards long before that. In our visits to Lusignan prison and Timari prisons, we saw lots of overcrowding too, with, with young men having to sleep in the canteen because there's not enough beds for them in the dormitories um, and so forth. Um, we also saw very big problems in the remand yard. So I, I say all this because I wanted to sort of do the obvious, say, you know, speak about coloniality and its extensions into the present. But I also think coloniality allows us to do something else. And, and in, in conclusion, I wanted to talk about something to do with the, the prisons of history and how, how maybe we write history and how we, we think about prisons. What I've been trying to get across here is that the prisons past and present kind of illustrate human beings' preoccupation with dehumanization. Um, and my, as my brief presentation kind of is suggesting there are numerous continuities here and connections between the past and the present. But colonialism um, also created new, new ways to think about reality and otherness. So these intersections between empire and governmentality have created prisons of sources of toxicity. So in this sense, prisons incarcerate and dehumanize the most marginalized members of society. Where, col where colonialism wants to find the other, now we might even say it's colonial prisons in the present that do some of this work. In the failure to improve infrastructure, regimes and education in prisons, for example, society in a production of its own humanity today in essence is rejecting the humanity of prisoners. Um, whether, you know, this is not necessarily self-conscious, but it does make sense to be explicit about how the biopolitics of colonial carcerality have extended and lived on. And I think this connects to a broader point made by scholars like Sylvia Winter and McKittrick. Um, and, 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 and I think one takeaway from these processes of post-colonial carcerality and biopolitics is it's, it's no longer the elites and the colonial elites and the plantation owners forcing or pushing these forms of violence and dehumanization. It's now the broader multi-ethnic societies at large that we live in where mostly where most people have not been incarcerated, but who maintain in some ways these colonial institutions and logics. Um, and in many ways, in a prediction of what Winter is talking about, work, live, and constantly produce a binary of othering between the insides and the outsides of prison walls. Prisoners, in this sense, are the other. And in the, in the rejection of prisoners' humanity, there's a, a sort of normalization of a form of violence and dehumanization rooted in the colonial past. Um, and it goes without saying such a binary is problematic um, and that the majority for validating their own humanity in this way, despite racial inequality, are not fully aware that, you know, colonial carcerality reconfigured through biopolitics has produced such a situation. Um, and I think this is a big question, right? But th the point I wanted to get to is, is why is it that colonial prisons still play such a role in Guyana when we know that their roots lie in the management of enslaved and bonded workers and knowing the destruction that that can cause. And it's not that I wanna move away from coloniality, but I, I think in some sense, coloniality trapped us in a prison of, of where we document these continualities when really what we maybe need to, to move towards is proposing new forms of humanity um, rather than just prove, you know, proving the continuities. The contemporary prison is obviously still a place of oppression and social control. The hierarchy of the prison and its methods of surveillance replicate the hierarchies of empire, um, premised on these old regimes and prejudices. And of course, in this sense, colonial carcerality is ongoing and evident. Um, so I guess I'm, what I'm saying is in the sense, the biopolitics of colonial carcerality, which were designed to dehumanize the colonized subject, and 
deny them the opportunity to be human still underpin the Guyanese prison regimes today. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's why I would like to, to leave it, if that's okay. Well, that was uh, pretty strong stuff there from uh, Dylan Kerrigan. I suspect there are certainly questions. I do, I, I, I do know that Scott Newton and, was it um, Ladine had their hands up previously for Stella. I hope, I, I hope you might, unless you can adapt your question to um, Dylan, um, you might want to come back at the very end for all speakers. Um, have we got questions for, oh, and, oh, it's a new hand, Scott. Is that a new hand? Yes. yes. Thank you. And this is Scott Newton, the head of the law school here at SOAS. So very grateful, Scott, for you um, um, kicking me to make this happen uh, and for being here with us, Scott Newton. Dylan, that, that was uh, a, an amazingly compelling presentation. And I, I wanted to raise one thing, um, which is the relation between uh, carcerality on the one hand, coloniality or post-coloniality, and specifically post-slavery. Um, because that, that seems, it's a, it, that's a complicated relationship to, to, to theorize. Um, it, and I, obviously Guyana is the, you know, it's a premier case because it combines both post-coloniality and uh, post-coloniality and post-slavery. Um, but I, briefly, I, I mean, the plantation is the original mass carceral space. Right, it's not a selective carceral space like a prison is a mass carceral place where an entire population is incarcerated. So that the, the plantations of the age of Atlantic slavery are, are the sort of the gulag archipelago of the day. Right, there's this vast array of carceral spaces which all incarcerate great numbers of people. So I, what difference does that make, right? So how do you separate out the, the, the specifically post-colonial aspects of contemporary carcerality and the post-slavery aspects of con contemporary carcerality. I mean, obviously, I, it, I mean, the obvious case is mass incarceration in the US must in some profound sense be related to the mass incarceration of slavery. But that's, I'm just, that, that, that strikes me as sort of overly facile. I'm just, I just wanted to get your, Great question. <laughs> Just hold off there. Um, other, other. I mean, that's a big question, Dylan. <laughs> yeah. Other, uh, um, other questions. I can see Maya. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Yeah, so to add on to um, Scott's question, I just want to throw in like also the concept of neocolonialism. And like, how does that play into like post-colonialism and, you know, post-slavery? Um, Cause you know, these emerging, but yet sustained uh, forms of carcerality and how it's not necessarily, a, you know the end of colonialism, but also just new forms of it that you know, fit within a political, global political economic system today that we're maintaining through, you know, neoliberalism um, for instance. And so, yeah, just want to get your thoughts on that. Thanks. Uh, and Caroline. Hi, Dylan. Um, I found the data quite um, interesting. Um, um, do you have any um, specific information relating to women um, in, in prison in Guyana? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, anybody else itching to... Great. Well, that's nice and, nice and neat. Um, you've got coloniality, <laughs> you've got um, uh, uh, the juxtaposition of slavery, and you've got neo-coloniality uh, linked to neoliberalism. There we go, Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, fantastic. I'll, I'll just take my lead from Stella saying I will try to offer some responses, but I'm sure I will answer these in um, not necessarily in full, complete ways. But thank you for the, the, the comments and the, the interest in the, 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 the stories we're telling. Um, so to start with, I might jump to, towards Maya and then come back to Scott, just because in some ways um, I'm somebody who also worked with neo-colonialism as a, as, as, a, as a sort of starting premise that this, 
division between things like colonialism, post-colonialism and neo-colonialism as a sort of, you know, the man-made social kind of definitions that we've divided up. And from a sort of Caribbean context, we always have little problems talking about post-coloniality because we don't really necessarily feel that, 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 that this moved. We feel that almost like it, it shifts you into a, into a space of discussion that's not necessarily about structural change, but just like making little small um, tweaks to the system. So it sort of continues as, as, as Maya was pointing out. And I, and I think a big part of that, that problem is also a sort of colonial amnesia. We don't necessarily connect the past to the present, right? We, we might start in the present, we might start with neoliberalism. And there's lots of, uh, a lot of uh, scholars who, who, who suggest that one of the things we do need to do and why coloniality is really important is to illustrate these longer connections. And I think a lot of people have, have struggled to make these connections in ways that um, are, are tangible, but I, I see that changing quite a lot in, in recent times with, with new bodies of work coming out that actually make more direct connections in terms of things like I was mentioning, like infrastructure or, or regimes or, or the management, things that you can actually hold on to and show connections. Um, but one of the reasons, and this is to jump to Scott, one of the reasons I was talking about the biopolitics today um, was is because I feel like that's a way to sort of maybe avoid these questions about eras and difference in, in, in time zones, because we know from, 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 you know, from our, you know, observations and from the stories that people tell from being prisoners from 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 the families themselves, that there's this direct, direct sort of connection between um, the systems of social control that have existed over time and a sort of development of, of, a, of, of, of a separate space, a space where these prisoners are sort of not seen as part of, of, of the society, right? Um, and I, I think that's quite problematic. So one of the things I've been trying to do with, with biopolitics allows you to connect to other things that don't necessarily rely on these definitions of eras so you can one of the reasons I start with mobilizing po poverty archipelagos is because there's a lot of literature that illustrates in coloniality terms that the people the numbers of people who end up in prisons often come from the same geographical kind of locations and communities right so it's not that you know say that, the, the, that there's an economic downturn in a country right that necessarily everybody's going to feel it and end up in jail um with, with equal problems of 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 of, of debt or whatever it, the, the majority will come from certain locations so we have a reoccurring kind of punishment this sort of sustained violence um so i guess i'm not really answering very well but my, my answer to these questions is in my own work is to find concepts that work. So in the Caribbean, I tried to do what Stella says, you know, pull from, from in her context, Uganda or Africa. Within the Caribbean, I tried to pull from these Caribbean authors. So, so people like Fanon, people like Sylvia Winter, who are speaking to that sort of Caribbean essence and experience. Um, and so I, I probably moved away in many ways from thinking about distinctions between sort of post-coloniality and post-slavery, because in some ways I feel that they lead me to a kind of end game where I don't really get to sort of like connect it all as one narrative. And I think that's something I've struggled with in the, the three or four years that we've been doing this project um, to really, you know, what we wanted to do was say, look, the mental health problems in the prisons are directly related to, to colonialism, right? And you can't really fit it like that. You kind of got to provide a more sophisticated um, body of evidence to make these connections. And, and it circulates through things like social class, families, education and those are the connectors that extend over long periods of time um, rather than things like um, discourse or necessarily um, I found necessarily eras so so I don't know if I you know really provide you with that answer there but I found that neo-colonialism is a more effective sorry my, my kid had a birthday and that's a balloon <laughs> popping in the background um, neo-colonialism is is for me a more fruitful way to have a discussion today but I often find it's not something that's picked up by a, a lot of scholars. Neocolonialism sort of out there as an old hat sort of concept. But I, I think it has a lot of merit, especially if you're speaking from a sort of Caribbean bottom up pers perspective. You know, a lot of the processes that people experience are still very much embedded in these kind of colonial hierarchies and, and logics between not just the, the, the within social class, but between different geographical locations like the global north and, and, and the global south. Um, and then, sorry, to jump onto Caroline's question, in, in, in Guyana, the, the, the female population, the, the, the women in prison, 
is really only in one prison. It's in New Amsterdam, which again is a very old prison, a very wooden prison. Um, they call it the, the paper prison because you can push things through the wall to other prisoners and, and, and because it's, it's all wooden that you can push things through. Um, and you have small, smaller numbers. I think when we, I was there last, uh, about two years ago, the population was under 100 uh, women in that. Um, many of them were, were, were arrested for things to do with trafficking um, and drugs trafficking because of where Guyana's location is. Um, you often hear very sad stories of, 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 of people being kind of forced into the, the, the transaction too, often maybe because of needs, financial needs or, or certain promises that were made to them. Um, and the support within the prison for women, I, I, from what I could see, was very limited, very much like the men. You do not have a lot of welfare officers in a prison. You might have one welfare officer for a whole population of around 200 people. Um, and that welfare officer is in charge of all their needs, um, from medical needs to also the, their court dates and stuff like that. Um, and that creates a lot of tension, both for women and for female inmates, uh, male and female inmates, because there's this lack of information, a lack of concern, a lack of support in terms of the medical things they might need. Um, so it's, 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 it's you know, a fairly depressing situation, you know, um, really on the ground. Um, but there are people, you know, there are organizations, the um, local organizations run by, um, you know, Guyanese people who, who are seeking to change things. One of the biggest problems I was trying to suggest here is a connection between the past and the present is a general apathy for anybody in prison. Everybody thinks people in prison to some extent have it okay and it's not too bad. Whereas when you actually explain to people what's going on, they're kind of shocked. So, and that was, that's a similar kind of premise to the colonial times, you know, people thought that what's going on in the prisons was okay and that's it. So, 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 so overall there is a, a kind of almost like a lack of local knowledge about what happens in the local prisons. And I think that's really a problem that needs to change somehow through public education or, or raising awareness, because perhaps it's more that when the public are more educated about these issues, they can lean on the politicians a little bit more for change, because I'm not sure it really changes coming from the politicians. Um, so yeah, so I kind of went off a few tangents there, but, but thanks for your questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dylan. That was a um, fantastic, central um, contribution to the project that we've um, launched here at SOAS. So we're very, very grateful um, uh, indeed. Um, can I now ask our next speakers, uh, Dr. Wangu Kimari and Dr. Anne Finks, to, to, to present next, I think presenting together. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to Stella and Dylan. I really learned a lot. And thank you for all of these engaging questions uh, and the ability to talk and try and make connections across the global south and a global south that includes Africa. I think when I first got this invitation, I was wondering whether the global south included Africa because we're so often off stage. But it seems like there's a really lots of intention and lots of intentionality behind this. And I think that's that's really powerful. Uh, so my name is Wangwe Kimari, and I'm a researcher, but I, I think uh, the work that I've tried to be doing for the last 15 years in a poor community in Madha, called Madari in Nairobi probably is what uh, has brought me here. Together with my friend and colleague Annie, uh, we'll be talking about um, carcerality in, in Kenya. And if I could just share my screen, let's see if that's possible. Um, I'll just start from, I hope you can, I'm a dinosaur. I don't know lots about technology, but I hope, yeah. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, thank yeah, you. Good. So together with uh, my friend and colleague, Annie Finks, will be talking about carcerality and the legacies of settler colonialism in Nairobi. <clears throat> so, and this builds on a paper that we just co-wrote together, but above all, our commitment to highlighting the enduring colonial violence in Nairobi and for in Kenya and for Annie also in Palestine. So I'll just, so this is the paper that we just wrote um, and that informs this, this conversation we are having. But even as we focus on the legacies uh, and, and also highlight quite a bit in this paper, 
the, the colonial provenance of carcerality in Kenya, even now colonial modes of punishment, of incarceration, of enclosure, of interrogation, of curfew, confiscation, separation, displacement and detention without trial are still deeply embedded in the spatial and ideological arrangements of post-colonial Kenya. I, if we were in a room, I would ask how many of you have been to Kenya and maybe some of you would put up your hands. <laughs> okay, I can see Dylan's been to Kenya. Uh, but I think uh, some of the themes we are addressing here are probably really quite uh, evident. And we know that, and as we've been talking about now, uh, even if we think the ostensibly post-colonial period has ruptured this carcerality, I would say in many ways, in poor communities, this has been expanded and exacerbated. So my, I'll take a few minutes to speak about the post-colonial articulations of this carcerality and Annie will talk uh, about the colonial provenance and articulations of this. And again, not to say that they are distinct time periods because often, often uh, people in Kenya talk about the coincidence or the, the presence of these dual tenses of colonialism and post-colonialism. And so I'm not here to talk about them in distinct periods, but just show how they came to be normalized. So the kinds of processes that led to the normalization of carcerality and also just to flag that to be sure carcerality is not um is not often a term used often in kenya i'm not sure if it's used often in in guyana and even in literature that's lots of important critical literature that reflects on colonial punishment and legacies in kenya it's not it's not foregrounded but at the same time both annie and i in uh in making connections in not thinking about how Carcerality is part of an assemblage or prompts an assemblage of punishment, of injury and harm. We found it, we found it quite useful for us and really building on how many people who are the subjects who suffer the most oppression from carcerality, how they narrativize their, their, their conditions really highlights, even if they don't use carcerality in, in local vernacular in Sheng, how they narrativize their present conditions really, uh, I think, substantiate the use of, of carcerality. So to do this, uh, I've given you all of my preamble. Uh, to do this, I'm going to focus on the settlement of Madare, where I have, I'm not from Madare, I'm actually really a very boring middle-class uh, researcher in Nairobi, <laughs> but I came to Madare maybe uh, 15 years ago, and I really, uh, it's kind of an accident, but not really an accident. And since then, I've been involved in a number of community activities for about the last 15 years. And so my reflections on carcerality, and I was actually there today, and I'll, some of what I learned today, I'll talk about later. But uh, I think the sharp um, contrast between my living conditions and I think the, the colonial oppression that still persists in Madare really I think have informed my, my thinking in many ways. And so Madare is often the site where, what for today it's a site where my thoughts on carcerality move through, but it's also where many of my thoughts on, on Nairobi are shaped. And before I talk about Madare, sorry, another, a small preamble. I think here we've talked a lot about prisons and uh, our talk is not so much about prisons. It's really about everyday carcerality and, and the different ways in which it is, is uh, it's materialized. But at the same time, it bears reflecting on, on prisons a little bit. We know the prison industrial complex is large and we are talking about this everyday carcerality, but at the same time, uh, we know and, and borrowing from Gadara that really the British, and I'm just gonna read a quote from Gadar. He says, there is no evidence of the existence of pre-colonial prisons in Kenya. However, it is notable that prisons were among the first buildings that the British built whenever they went into a future colony. And really, I think uh, if my history serves me right, the police were one of the first state forces in, in Kenya, even before it was a colony, when it was a protectorate, when it was the Imperial, it was the British East African protectorate. And these small fortifications, whether it was of 
wood or whether it was of, um, in Kenya you call it kayaba, but kind of thorny bush, those were still prisons and really one of the first uh, buildings that the British built. And within 16 years of their arrival in Kenya in 1895, the British had built 30 prisons with an average daily incarcerated population of uh, 1,500 people. We currently have a population about, of about 54,000 prisoners in Kenya, but of those, uh, roughly 50% are there awaiting uh, trial. So no one knows whether they're, they haven't gone through the due process to discern whether they're, they're guilty or not. Many of them are in remand because they can't afford bail because bail sometimes is so arbitrary. And so I just wanted to, while we're talking about everyday carcerality, I just wanted to flag that as well, but also flag that to also in holding that uh, up or holding that in space, also flag how everyday carcerality fits into, into these uh, prison formations or, or yeah, into prisons. And obviously the logics that informed the building of prisons for the native population, because that's what, who they were built for, are the same ones. So these logics that build prisons in Kenya, are the same ones that inform uh, the creation of racialized zones that produce spaces like Madare. So Madare emerged uh, as a discarded landscape. No white person wanted to live in this area. They said it was full of mosquitoes, it's a floodplain. Uh, so this area, Madare is, emerges from this uh, colonial narration as an unwanted space that was not the geography that Europeans were to live on. And so Africans were put here, South Asian populations were put as kind of a buffer and Europeans lived in higher areas, no, not that many mosquitoes and that were not flood flames. So the same logics of separation, uh, of detention or containment that operate and operationalize prisons are what produce uh, spaces of like Madarian. These are racialized logics, of course. And um, in, in thinking about how carcerality operates here, I, I think I'm going to focus in particular on detention of curfews and surveillance and containment. And to bring this to the present, um, I'm going to focus on an event, a really problematic event that happened at the beginning of, of 2020 when the, the COVID regulations were put in place. So Yasin Moyo, uh, a 13 year old boy was shot. And I'm going to read an extract. He was shot as part of this enforcing of COVID regulations in, in Madare, which doesn't make sense at all. Um, but it's part of a, a continuous process of surveilling, of uh, killing, of extorting, of separating, and of seeking to contain uh, problematic populations who were only problematic, who become problematic in, in this colonial period. So I'll just read a brief news report from then. Early in the COVID-19 prompted lockdown in March 2020, the police killed a 13-year-old boy in Madare, Yasin Moyo, who was on his balcony 20 minutes after the 7 p.m. curfew began. Over the next few months, more would be killed and injured as part of the enforcement, ostensible enforcement of coronavirus measures in this poor area and across the country. Highlighting the, the extreme nature of containment measures. So while in other more prosperous sections of Nairobi, the price for non-adherence to the rules could be a bribe or less, here, as in other poor settlements, the overzealous and violent policing of the lockdown curfew, initially from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m., led many to declare that they have killed us more than corona. So the reason, obviously, Yasin Moyo is brought here to be memorialized. Here's a picture that we had recently commemorating his really, his awful death. But um, the curfew is brought also because it, it emerges from provisions of the public order ordinance that dates from the British colonial administration of Kenya. In fact, not even the time has changed. When the British had the curfew, it was during the Mau Mau period or when they were fighting uh, the Mau Mau or the Kenya Freedom Fighters, the curfew was the same, 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. And so this reinstantiation of the curfew, we can see emerges from, has this colonial 
origin. And as we can hear from this news report, although while the government we may say that uh, the enforcement of these regulations or the enforcement of uh, how this, this enforcement of COVID regulations is neutral, we can see it's not neutral and it's implemented uh, more forcefully in geographies like uh, Madare here, not, not where I live at all. And this then echoes the, the policing of the native city, even if Africans were not really allowed to live in the city, there was the native city. It highlights the kind of carceral logics that still, that still inform uh, governance of, of the city. And for me, the police are, in many cases in, in, in poor urban settlements in Nairobi, the police are the number one face of the state where there's no water and no public services. And I, sorry, I, I, I need to make some space for Annie. So just in brief, I just wanted to talk about other measures. And this is a picture of uh, a raid, a recent raid that was conducted again in Madara in a picture I took, you can see police trucks and police van and other ways that geographies like Madare are, are, you can see how carceral logics are still in place, this heavy surveillance, this, this poor community that's only three square kilometers in size and has 206,000 people is governed, is surrounded by four police stations and a military airbase. Uh, between April 2019 to June 2021, we documented 99 people killed by the police. And those that's a body count of bodies that were seen. But we also need to remember that there are many bodies that are just disappeared. There's still continuous raids and uh, formal curfew, like we had during COVID, but the informal curfew endures and is still uh, really young men don't want to leave the house after seven. There's still lots of extortion. There's still lots of searches. So these are these are ways that the carceral logics are in play. And, and before I make way for Annie, I just wanted to say that in some ways, in many ways, and in reference to what Dylan is saying, unfortunately, Kenyans have normalized this and for it's become just a normalized way to govern uh, poor people. But there are many groups, and this is important to highlight, and I think part of why we're meeting, who are trying to, to do something about it. For example, uh, the Social Justice Center's working group, which is a collection of about 49 community-based organizations or social justice organizations distinct from NGOs, and they make that distinction very explicit, that come together to, to document human rights violations, but also to, to organize to end them. Um, and just by way of introducing Annie in our work, we talk about how, um, and quoting Bembe, um, he says the punitive was a founding ethos of colonial sovereignty, wherein the lack of justice of the means and the lack of legitimacy of the ends conspired to allow an arbitrariness and in, an intrinsic unconditionality that may be said to have been the distinctive feature of colonial uh, sovereignty. Certainly, and as we've tried to put forward, the post-colonial Kenyan state has really inherited this unconditionality and the regime of impunity that was the color, colorally, I can't say that English word, colorally of the, of, yeah, the colonial regime. And so now I will let, that's just a small introduction to Annie. I will let you go ahead. Annie, I know you, do you want me to leave the pictures on? Yes, I'll tell you when to change them. So just okay. go back to the one that you just had up. Okay, and um, thank you both for all of you for enduring my- uh, Thanks, Wangui my dinosaur technology techniques. Uh, one second, Annie, let me just get back. Okay. That's all right. I think yeah. here. Um, I'll, I'll just do very brief. This is an image actually taken from the internet, but it's during the Mau Mau. And I think it's probably from Operation Anvil that cleared Nairobi, East Nairobi, which includes Matare, of its men, of, it, of its um, Kenyan men. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But following on from what Wangui's talked about, um, in underpinning the logic of settler colonialism, the carceral that I understand as the punitive term, this is about punishment, 
defines and determines criminality. They're, and in that, in, in defining and determining criminality, it authorizes spatial, temporal, and material modes of punishment, including framing resistance um, to occupation, to dispossession, to capitalist extractive land use as criminality, as subversion, as lawlessness, as disorder and as disloyalty. And although we're now talking about Kenya, I also make specific reference to the ongoing nature of that punitive mode across Palestine, and particularly with reference to the siege of Gaza, but not only, it's the whole of historic Palestine. Um, resistance is punished, as we know. So, um, so the colonial arbitrariness, as Wangu has mentioned, Kariuki Gituku suggests disguised as legality, entrenched privileges and rights, while simultaneously delegitimizing, de repressing, and extinguishing the aspirations of Africans. And in the sort of class hierarchies with Nairobi, we can see this operating. So the aspirations of Matari residents are um, defined as, as not legal, essentially. In the 1950s, the British administration threw a military cordon through Operation Anvil surrounding East Nairobi arresting all those considered to be, and I think this language is interesting from the colonial records, lawless, ruthless, and shiftless persons. Um, they were sent for interrogation and incarceration. Um, and the operation also aimed to ensure that other tribes, and I'm using that word from the archives advisedly, would not be contaminated by Mau Mau ethos, by the Mau Mau ethos. Colonial modes of punishment through what Stuart Hall framed as the discursive regime of race endure and come together with a further two imperatives. I'll just make a comment on this image. These are, this is during the emergency. These women are being sent. This is Nairobi. It's actually Pumwani. And Pumwani was a community hall. During the emergency, it was turned into a, a, a police station and it still operates as a police station, effectively policing Matare. So that's a kind of like a, a material link, if you like. Um, so the, the colonial modes of punishment through what? Through the discursive regime of race endure. And they come together with a further two imperatives. One is this is that of settler colonialism and the other is of the states, both of which have an obsession with control. The state's self-preserving force, suggests Sylvia de Ferreira, manifests in structures of containment and that cause injury and harm in lots of ways which could be, expect, could be argued is in fact the intention. Um, Uh, so I'm just going to finish, because I know we have a lot of time, with five interconnecting structures. Um, this is, again, an archive image from the period of the emergency of Mau Mau, or should I say the Kenya, Kenya Land and Freedom Army uprising. We, we developed five interconnecting structures that dissemble and reassemble carceral modes of containment, control, and punishment. And I'm only going to mention very briefly. What the first one is the eliminatory logic inherent to the structure of settler colonialism. The second is the institutions, structures, and systems that combine to make up violence. The third is the structure of racism that together with the structure of colonial corporeality defines and determines the body, corpore the body, corporeality and social political location of the colonized. 
we would now say, and of the marginalized. And the fifth is the structure of capitalism that engenders the continuities and discontinuities of the economies of an extract, extraction, production, and labor. And our argument is that those five structures are intertwined. So racism, the extractive industries, um, the institutions of violence, settler colonialism, inform and shape each other. Um, I'm gonna stop there because I know our time is short. Okay. Well, thank you both very much indeed. Um, can I ask um, for questions? Um, I in terms of the time available, um, yeah, I think we can have questions to uh, Annie and one guy first, and then we can open it up to everybody. Any questions? Well, I've got a question. I've got a question about the, I hadn't seen this idea of everyday carcerality. That was new to me. And I thought phenomenally interesting because it makes me think of lots of, uh, in, a, in, a, in a global North sense, lots of, um, what we would call downtown in the American consciousness or inner city in the um, European consciousness areas of town. Um, so I wanted you to deepen that and to, to perhaps say when you think historically that started within the Kenyan context. It also makes you think of shanty towns and ghettos, so it's, it's quite a big idea. Um, so I wondered if you might deepen that idea because it's really, really good. Um, I can see that Bella has her hands up. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say thank you for your lecture. Um, it was very interesting. I, I um, grew up in Kenya uh, as well, but obviously uh, middle upper class as well. And, uh, and so one thing that I knew, like I'm very aware of, um, especially around settler colonialism is that also just um, private properties and how those are very like almost, you know, at, like, you know, uh, fenced off. And I was just wondering if you could, if you have any links to what you're talking about, everyday carcerality and, you know, the racial carceral regimes and a link to the fact of these like um, fenced off private properties that, are, you know, are all over, let's say, Nairobi. Thank you, Bella. And Caroline, I should say that Caroline's been assisting uh, with this project at SERS. I'm very grateful, Caroline. Caroline. Thank you. Um, I found um, Annie's um, discussion about structure really interesting. Um, I'm studying the experiences of um, Black women in prison in the UK and having lived in the Caribbean, so I'm, um, I've spent most of my um, early years in Jamaica. And I also worked as a lawyer. I worked in the courts in Jamaica and I saw the representatives of you know men being in chains, their feet chained and the, the links back to slavery. However, um, I've noticed that when I was in the Caribbean, race didn't figure very highly on my thoughts of structure. It was about poverty, it was about colonialism. Um, now that I'm in the UK and I've lived here for the last 20 years, race is very, very high on my agenda of structure. Um, would anyone have any thoughts or reflections on that in terms of if there's anyone of, of the panel who made any comparisons between um, North and South, um, just for, for, for simplification purposes, or from you know, what happens in the, um, for want of a better word, in the developing world and, um, you know, any reflections on race and, and comparisons. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, 
Annie will come back to that, but we'll also open that up. So we hold that thought that Caroline has had, the wider group. Any other questions, observations, specifically Wango and Annie? Okay, then we'll come back. Okay, Annie, why don't you go ahead? Because I started, so feel free. Um, the question of the everyday. I mean, I think this is why, for me, pastoral geography is such an interesting framework to work within. Because, yes, it is about prisons and imprisonment, but it actually it's, it's, about, it's about the carceral space. And the carceral space shapes privilege, it shapes vulnerability, it shapes access to resources, and it is racially determined. And I think that, you know, like if I was to talk about Palestine, there's not a Palestinian family who hasn't had someone in prison for some period of time over the last hundred years. If we talk about Kenya and we talk about Matare, there isn't a family who hasn't had a confrontation with police or has had a son that's been shot in the, in the alleys by police. So the every, it's, carcerality is a geography. It's a geography that determines access and life and capacity to live. Um, and it's linked into the prison system, but it isn't only about the prison. It isn't only about the cell. It's actually about the links. And in terms of coloniality, that link between surveillance, arrest, interrogation, detention was a core component of colonial administration. Um, and people, you know, Kenyans went from, well, they didn't leave the detention camps till the 60s, but, you know, they would like the women would go from Pumwani back to the reserves. They would be, um, I'll keep this brief. Okay, so that, that, that's, that's, that's the nature of cultural geography as an everyday space. And it's, it's the hierarchies and it's the in and out nature of um, policing that also determines where you're located, how you're located, how precarious your life is, and whether your life is recognized as livable. I'm going to borrow from Judith Butler for a minute. Is your life worth? Does your life have worth? Are you recognized? Are you seen? If you're not, you're, precar you're in precarity, you're vulnerable, you're in a carceral state. And just to thank so much, Annie, and just to add to that, you know, everyday carcerality is, takes place in so many ways. And I, I use it because for me, it, uh, before people get to the prison, there's so many ways uh, in which their life, people have sought to contain their lives, surveil their lives. And just as a, as a brief example, today I was in a room with 30 people, uh, men, women, kids, Borana, Muslim, ethnic Somali, all kinds who, who live in Madare. And they were there because we are trying to write a report, another one, uh, but a, a participatory one on, on uh, the work that this group called the Mothers of Victims and Survivors uh, Network. So a network of people whose family members have been killed by the police or who've been beaten are trying to deal with this everyday carcerality, which is a continuum from materially from you being uh, denied an identity document. And if you don't have an identity document, then it's you being stopped all the time, surveilled all the time, uh, materially also in terms of policing, but also immaterially in the fear that's instilled in them that you should not, uh, you're not allowed, you don't have value you, your life is at risk if you question the police, your life is at risk if you question these things. So there's both material and immaterial ways through which carcerality is, is reproduced in, in particular spaces like Annie was saying. And in terms of race, it's really, there's really a very direct link between Madare, which was always the, 
and areas like it, the ungovernable space or the ungovernable Africans. These are not the Africans that that would be recruited to fight in the Second World War or recruited as part of the native arm of the civil service. This was always the ungovernable Africans and in how that space has been neglected in terms of basic services, but also how the narratives produced about it uh, endure. We can see a direct link to colonialism, but also the racialization. And even now racialization is, is part of that. That's the African space. It's not a space where you would find South Asian descendants, it's not a place where you'd find white Kenyans at all. And so that racialization still takes place. And even while it's denied by all of this, like uh, declaration that we are in a post-colonial state, Madare residents are fourth generation people who've lived there, who are this, who moved there because they were dislocated from their farms, who were displaced from their farms, or who didn't have a place to go after they were detained by the colonial government. So in many ways, there, there are very many links to racism. And I feel sometimes we, we don't highlight that enough in post-colonial studies of, of Africa. In terms of property, I would say, and I hope I understood your question uh, well, Bella, but there's definitely a um, to reproduce privilege or to reproduce walls, you need to you inevitably, unfortunately, reproduce fear of people coming for our stuff. And so, and I think there's a lot of, um, there's so many, most of where I live is, is walls. Most people have walls. There's always this fear of the, and Dylan was talking about this other, this other person who's going to come and take this. And equally as in Guyana, it's us now in this context in, supposedly six years after independence who are reproducing the very same narratives or recreating these others that need to live in specific geographies or need to be contained in, in prison. So I hope that in some ways that has uh, responded to your question. Thank you so much. Um, you'll forgive me, but I have to move on to another meeting such as the nature of my day job. This has been absolutely fantastic. Really so wonderful, such a rich, rich conversation. I'm terribly excited now that uh, SAS have asked me to do this. <laughs> I'm bringing all these amazing people together so we could change the world, <laughs> or at least our small space of it. Um, but I'm gonna hand over um, to Ollie De Rose um, just to curate um, questions perhaps to the to the entirety of the panel that we've had um, uh, and to draw this um, to an end. I know Nadine had a question from earlier. I hope Nadine, you might come back. I don't know if Scott Newton is with us, but Scott might want to come in just before we close um, as well. Very, very grateful indeed. Thank you so much um, um, to, to all of you for your contributions. And I'm, I'm sort of in touch with you separately and together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ollie. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I'd just like to echo his thanks before I open up to the floor. That was uh, awesome. Uh, thanks so much for your contributions. Um, a really, really broad range um, of themes and topics there. And already I think we've seen how there are lots of debates within these topics um, that we can uncover. Um, I don't know if Annie, you had your you have your hand up. Yeah, I did want to take some months, but I actually wanted to ask um, Stella. We've been talking about the everyday of culturality. What would your experience? How would you understand that, given your experience? Right. So um, I, I appreciate the question. I also appreciate the 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 jogging of my mind to to, to consider um, everyday carcerality outside the confines of the bars of prison and detention. I, I think the, the first immediate response for me was, ah, lockdown, when the whole world was locked down and we were all forced to be in a huge jail and everything you talked about, surveillance, um, curfew, raids, etc. was, well, not raids, so what? raids on the supermarkets maybe, 
but but the disparities between those who have and those who don't access to vaccines and those who can get gas cylinders and those who die without gas was happening on an everyday. The, the prisons of Madari, the prisons enforced by poverty, I think for me raise immediate issues around criminalization of poverty. So in, your, in, in in prison, when I was in prison, I was shocked at how many poor women were dragged in every day simply because they were poor trying to eke a living. And so when they get out of the shanty towns and go to the streets of the, the, the gentrified cities and spaces, in Uganda, we have anti vagrancy laws, so, so vagabonds and public nuisances and people who are in the wrong places putting dirt where cleanness has been constructed are cleared up routinely. And um, if one, as, as, as Wangui clearly said, if one cannot afford either the bribe um, for, for, for the, for the, for the city authorities who are taking them away, one has to face uh, immediate um, take, taking of plea at the city court immediate that day of, of, of cleaning the city. And many times these poor people don't know the language of court. They're so poor, the status doesn't even entail uh, opening one's mouth and immediately they're shipped off. So, 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 so it's kind of double <laughs> carcerality, this word carcerality. I like how Wangui said, we don't use carcerality often in Uganda either. We use prison and detention and punishment. But the idea of assemblages, what would you say an assemblage of harm and punishment? And I was writing down an injury, beautiful, you know, big English words. Um, I, I understood the, 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 the giving of a name to what we live with every day. And, and, and I see what you're saying, but I think for me, this duality between the everyday Madari and then people are shipped off and taken into detention facilities where to be poor, one does 60 days. And so we returnally had uh, vendors of food carrying food on their heads or whatever wares, boys begging with begging bowls and tins um, and, and young women as well coming into prisons. And, and so it, it, it's, it's ongoing. I think Kenya very much um, is a replica of Uganda in, in, in that case. So brilliant, brilliant ways of thinking around carcerality. Dylan, do you have a question? Yes, thanks. I just wanted to, to, to build on the conversation my, my colleagues are having, because in the Caribbean, everything that you spoke about is what we see in Trinidad, what we see in Guyana, what we see in Jamaica. These are similar processes. And, 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 and when, when you were speaking, I, was, I felt very much you were speaking to the experiences that I've seen and, and spoken to many people. And this everyday carcerality. Um, is something that that we we mobilise a lot using this. Um, what, what I think was it was it one of our colleagues in the audience said about gated communities and this sort of division of life. And and I felt that the the, the way that you spoke about COVID too in in Trinidad and elsewhere, it's like in Jamaica, we sometimes have lockdowns because of crime, right? Because the whole society goes into curfew because of of of, of, of they want to lock down on the, the criminality element. So that there's this constant kind of feeling of you never know when that might happen. Um, and, and just conceptually, so we, we sometimes now in criminology talk about carceral masculinities as a way to think about how carcerality impacts gender in a sort of male context outside and how it comes back into the prison and this relationship between the inside and the outside of the prison that there isn't really, yeah, there's these walls, but there's this constant movement from the inside and the outside of the prison. And when you're thinking about carcerality, I've, I've just thought, and this is me personally, but conceptually to, to mobilize other other metaphors that are quite helpful to me, like this idea of what masculinity on the outside of a prison then becomes on the inside of a prison and then how that feeds back into what masculinity. It's the same thing I think sometimes with carcerality is becoming this geographical thing that Annie was talking about where certain pockets, um, like Winter talks about these poverty archipelagos that really like play a major role in the actual bodies that kind of feed into this circularity. Um, and obviously I'm, I'm, I'm 
plugging in lots of conceptual things here, but there's, there's a lot of conceptual ways that people try to talk about these things. And I think it's quite interesting to listen to, you speak about Uganda, you speak about Kenya, I speak about Guyana, we're speaking about the same things, but using slightly different terminology. So is there more merit that we all have to kind of move towards speaking in a more, I don't know, the same language in a sense, because we're talking about the same things, but we're building from the bottom up in each of our kind of geographical locations. And does that, does that create problems of, in, of intelligibility between these ideas or, or, or is that not a dilemma? I, I don't know, it was a question that sort of was nagging at me slightly that it, do we need more of these moments where we connect to say, look, these are the same things happening here. Not that we don't know that already, but it was so visceral today for me. If I can just, uh, so thank you all. And I really am grateful for the learning today. And if I can just briefly respond to that, partially why I, I like carcerality is because um, there's some things that, uh, partially why I like carcerality is because it allows us to, to think that this is not, you know, everyone is always like, Africans are always killing themselves, endangering themselves, all of these things. These are just African pathologies, but they're not. They are part of a, of a continuous imperial process. And I, I, I really appreciate casserality or, or sometimes common vernacular because it allows us to see these, these similar logics and similar structurings. Whereas if we just think of, uh, like singularities will say, oh, this is, these are just how Africans live. And I, I really, uh, obviously we should problematize that, but I'm very grateful for a, a vernacular that's expansive enough to allow us to see these different connections. Perfect, thanks so much. Um, just on that last point to wrap up, um, we have a conference in September, on the 78th of September, um, and the deadline to the call for papers is meant to be on Monday uh, because we're trying to do a, a tight uh, turnaround. However, um, I'd really encourage um, any participants in the, in, the, in the chat to really um, reach out and um, submit. And obviously that's a tight deadline. So if you want to just email me, I'm going to post the uh, link online there and that's my email. We can definitely sort out um, an extension to the deadline because I... Um, I know this is like a fast moving project um, because hopefully what this conference will do um, effectively is draw on these concepts of carcerality because this workshop, the title, was actually a point of debate uh, amongst ourselves, um, you know, incarceration in the global south. First of all, incarceration uh, is that too narrow a concept um, and also global south, what does that mean and what are the, you know, political um, meanings of that term and so that's why this is just like a starting point. And I'm so grateful for uh, the speakers for, for, for doing this because it's introducing these concepts, but with a willingness to try to scrutinize um, and to open up the terms that we're relying on, um, as Dylan said, to try and draw comparisons between uh, different countries. Um, so that's where the next workshop actually, which we're trying to organize is on bordering and detention and deportation, because this is also a form of carcerality that often gets ignored by the prison-centric discussion. Um, and yeah, the conference hopefully will bring all these ideas together, um, a really broad range of activists, researchers, academics, um, so we can all discuss these. So yeah, I'm gonna stay on, the, um, on this chat, just if anybody has any questions about the conference. Um, but for now, I just wanna thank um, all of our speakers, uh, Dr. Stellan Yanzi, Dr. Wangri Kamari, Dr. Annie Finks, and Dr. Dida Kerrigan. It's really, really, um, a pleasure uh, for you to be here. So it's, thank you so much. Um, really, really grateful. Um, and yeah, keep in touch so we can see how this project um, keeps going. I'm going to stay on the line um, just if anyone has any questions. But yeah, thanks again. Really grateful. Thank you. Holly, can, Holly, can I just pop in? Yeah. Um, everyone, uh, I can't thank you enough. This has been a... a absolutely transformative couple of hours here. I, 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 will, I want you all to know that when Ollie, David and I sat down together, I think it was almost a year ago uh, to plan this project, um, we were all seized with, with enthusiasm at the prospect. Uh, and now a year on, I mean, I, I, I have to tell you, I, I feel a mixture of pride and humility. Um, pride at, at, at having assembled such an extraordinary tour de force 
um, of, of, of speakers and topics today and humility in their presence. You know, uh, the prisons are, 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 and carceral spaces are terribly confined and close, but I, I have an extraordinary sense of expansion today, both experiential and, 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 and conceptual expansion, and that's all down to you. So I, I really think we're, we're on the verge of, of, of mapping out an entirely new developing research agenda um, and we, we've had uh, just an amazing, riveting, transformative, as I said, set of presentations. And also, a, 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 I, I think, um, a wonderful display of the appropriate mode of analysis here. I mean, I think that, 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 that uh, we've had a combination of analysis, of testimony, of poetry, um, which I think is is, is is a high bar for the rest of this project. I mean, I, I, I wish that every time we gather, um, we, we, we will be able to operate in, in just this kind of, of multi-dimensional mode. So I wanna thank um, our, our, our brilliant panelists. Uh, I wanna thank Ali, I wanna, Ali, I wanna thank uh, David in his absence. And I wanna thank everyone who, who took the time and trouble to attend today and to contribute and, and, and participate. So I, I look very much look forward to, to the next one and I will see you all then. Thank you.